It's time for Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, inviting the atheist, agnostic, and skeptic to examine for themselves the evidence for the Christian faith. We are all limited by what we do not know and by the things we think we know but are not true. Dr. Joe Mott earned his Ph.D. at LSU and was a distinguished math professor at Florida State University for 38 years, helping to write three math textbooks and authoring over 30 research articles in math. He is now the host of this radio program, Defending and Commending the Faith. Here is Joe Mott. Hello to everyone. Welcome to the program. Let me refresh our memories about several topics we have discussed in times past. For the last several episodes, we have been discussing worldviews. Recall that a worldview is an all-encompassing perspective on everything that exists and all that concerns us. It is a frame of reference a way of viewing or interpreting all of reality, a collection of assumptions about the way reality is structured. A worldview refers to a comprehensive conception of the world from a specific standpoint. Anyone's worldview, then, is a big picture of the world, a harmony of all our beliefs, about reality, a lens through which we interpret everything we encounter, a map from which we discover our interactions to everything about us. One's worldview is the basis for making daily decisions and is therefore extremely important. In particular, it impacts the way we think. Every human being has a worldview. The only question, is it a good one or a bad one? Since the worldview is a big picture of all reality from a specific perspective, the Christian worldview then is a worldview from the perspective of Christianity and of the Bible. An apple sitting on a table, seen by many different people and interests, understands it from different perspectives. A botanist looking at the apple classifies it. A grocer sees it as an asset and inventories it. A child sees it as lunch and eats it. How we look at any situation is influenced by how we look at the world at large. Every worldview, Christian and non-Christian, deals with at least the five fundamental questions preceded by a descriptive word. These are given in the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, by Norman Geisler and Frank Turret. Origin, where did we come from? Identity, who are we? Meaning, why are we here? Morality, how should we then live? Destiny, where are we going after death? Our worldview will concern the question, what is wrong with the world, and how can what is wrong be made right? Recall that formerly I offered a comparison test for worldviews that consist of the following four questions. Who am I? Identity. Why am I here? Meaning. What is wrong with the world? Morality, from another perspective. How can what is wrong be made right? The Christian's calling. I claim that the answer to each of these four questions ultimately depend on the existence of God. If God exists, then there is ultimate meaning and purpose to your life. If there is real purpose to your life, then there is a real right and wrong way to live it. And if it's wrong, we sense it must be made right to be beneficial. Thus, the choices you and I make now not only affect your heart now, 
but will affect us in a future eternity. This is where God's plan of redemption comes into play. There have been various kinds of atheists throughout history. Some have argued that the very idea of God is mythological, and there is no need for such mythology in modern times. Others say that there once was a God, but he died. That was pronounced by Friedrich Nietzsche and Thomas Altheiser. Others have argued that because of the finitude and limitations of language about God, we really cannot know anything about such a being as God. I will not attempt to address and refute these ideas, but focus my attention on other atheistic claims. Other atheists often state categorically that there never has been and never will be a God. But this last statement is logically indefensible. Only someone who is capable of being in all places at the same time with perfect knowledge of all that is in the universe can make such a statement based upon the facts. Let me repeat that. One would have to search every place in the universe thoroughly and simultaneously, in essence, having infinite knowledge of the universe, in order to make this assertion based upon the facts. This view amounts to saying, quotes, I have infinite knowledge, that no being exists with infinite knowledge, end quotes. To put it another way, a person would have to be God in order to say that God does not exist. Still other atheists have realized that they cannot prove God does not exist from their own pool of knowledge. So they refrain from arguing against the existence of God. Instead, the prominent atheist and author George H. Smith argues that atheism in its most basic form is not a belief at all, but rather is the absence of a belief. Richard S. Russell argued that atheism is said to be no more a religion than bald is a hair color or health is a disease. The atheist Cliff Walker affirms the definition for atheism that we atheists use, put simply, that atheism is the lack of a God belief. In changing the narrative, They are attempting to turn the tables on Christians in order to get them to take up the burden of proof that God does exist. We can do that with a plume. But the flaw with this line of argumentation from atheists is that once you say, I lack a belief in God, is tantamount to affirming a religious truth claim, and therefore they are required to accept the burden of proof onto themselves. But the idea of atheism has consequences. If there is no God, then your life ultimately means nothing. Recall the atheist Richard Dawkins has said, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. There is... At bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Therefore, the atheist will claim that if there is no enduring purpose to life, there is no right and wrong way to live it. And it doesn't matter what you believe. Your destiny is annihilation. You simply return to dust. Contrarily, the Christian worldview affirms that, first, a personal, ethical, self-revealing, transcendent God exists. What evidence supports that affirmation? Allow me to identify different evidences 
by letters. A, the Bible assumes it. The Bible declares that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. It implies that only a fool, ignorant of the facts, would deny God's existence, and then not overtly, but secretly in his heart. The Bible is written on the premise that the evidence for God is so strong that no one really well-informed, open-minded person would deny his existence. B. Reason concludes it. Big Bang cosmology indicates that the universe has a beginning and that space, matter, and time came into being along with the universe. The law of causality requires that back of every effect there must be a cause. The universe is the effect. Then what is its cause? Did nothing produce something? No. Did the universe come into being by chance? It is possible, but too improbable, so not reasonable. Thus, the first cause for the universe must be spaceless, immaterial, and not temporal. In other words, we could say that the first cause of the universe must be omnipotent, immaterial, or spirit, and eternal. Thus, reason would lead us to conclude there is a superior mind, which we call God. The cause of mind and reasoning ability in every human, the first cause of the universe and the first cause of life on earth, that is more reasonable than the consequences of atheism. The Bible agrees. Quote, for every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything, end quotes. That's found in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4. C, cosmological order suggests it. When we see a great architecture, we know there was a wise architect. When we hear a beautiful song, we know there was a composer. When we read a book, we know there was an author. When we observe a watch, we know there is a watchmaker. When we discuss a law, we know there is a lawgiver. The earth is said to weigh about 6.57 times 10 to the 21st tons. Its diameter is about 8,000 miles and 25,000 miles in circumference. Yet the earth is more accurate in its movements than the finest and most delicate watch made by man. The earth travels 595 million miles in a year as it circles the sun. Yet it does not vary in the length of time it takes for each trip by as much as one second. And it has done this for multitudes of years. Therefore, this first cause of the heavens and the earth is exceedingly powerful and intelligent. D. Creative nature proclaims it. The psalmist declared, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. That's found in Psalm 19, verse 1. The apostle Paul adds, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. That's found in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. E, intuition senses it. Human beings intuitively recognizes a higher being and desires to worship it. How can all this be explained? A wise and powerful God is the most reasonable answer. In previous episodes, I have proved that this first cause of the universe is identical to the God of the Bible. Thus, the God of the Bible is the great I Am. 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is Yahweh, the God of Judaism and Christianity. There are three main religions that believe in only one God, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Islam and Christianity, in fact, hold some similar beliefs. But Islam disagrees with Christianity on many other issues. I will return to this area of agreement and disagreement in the next episode. In the meantime, exercise daily. Walk with God. Thank you for listening to Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, a production of Wave 94 Radio in Tallahassee, Florida. If you have any questions or comments for Joe, please forward them to Doug Apple at Wave 94 at this email address, dougapple at wave94.com. And be sure to join us every Monday evening at 6.45 p.m. on Wave 94 and subscribe through your favorite podcast app, Defending and Commending the Faith, with Joe Mott.